Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Stepping Up. I'm your host, Daniel Dubois. This week, we feature the Boys Training Center. Now, as St. Lucians, we all know of or have heard about the Boys Training Center. This week, together, we will learn about the history and get to understand the inner workings as we meet the manager and other personnel who are integral to the growth and development of the boys who pass through the doors. The Boys Training Center was formally founded on the 20th of February 1960 and was initially built to house approximately 40 boys. Its creation and founding stemmed from the fact that by the late 1950s, the authorities in St. Lucia were bombarded with prevailing patterns of delinquent behavior among males, and suggested that it had become necessary for the nation to employ services of a residential facility that could both accommodate and rehabilitate a growing number of delinquent youths. Among the group of delinquent youths were those who were oftentimes also children with respect to school and home, and who instead would loiter the city where they committed a range of offenses. Thus, it became necessary for the state to seek to remedy the situation through a residential agency that would offer such youths greater supervision than what they were receiving in their respective domestic settings. At the time, there was no existing non-governmental organization or private entity that could cater to such a great societal need. The founding of St. Lucia's first residential agency for children in need of supervision and care became obligatory as a government task. Mr. Stanislas James, now Sir Stanislas James, is credited with being the chief founder of the facility that would thenceforth provide supervision and care for such youths. At the time of its founding, the institution was called the Boys Industrial School. In 1976, it was renamed the Boys Training Center. Sixty years on, the Boys Training Center continues this mandate till this day. Let's take in the first interview with the manager of the center, Mr. Wang Song Song, as he tells us a little bit more. Mr. Song Song, how are you? I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. Can you let us know about, just give us a general overview of the Boys Training Center, its mandate, its role, the role that it plays in the St. Lucian society today? Okay, well, the Boys Training Center this year, as I've been said before, is celebrating 60 years of existence in St. Lucia. Um, the center is, um, was, was originally built to house um, two categories of, of boys. Boys that are in need of care and protection and those that are in conflict with the law. All boys who come to the center come to us via a court order, either through the um, human services, probations, or the police. Um, when the boys get here, our mandate at the center is to ensure that they are cared for in a safe environment, and at the center, we have a number of activities and programs that are put in place, um, all in the aim of providing rehabilitation to those boys. Um, on staff, we have counselors. We have actually three counselors on staff, a social worker. Um, we have a guidance counselor. And their, their role is to provide um, counseling and, and therapeutic intervention to the boys. Each boy, upon coming to the center, is assigned a counselor and um, they partake in either group or individual counseling. We also have um, technical and vocational subjects being offered here to the boys. We also have um, um, class. Some boys attend classes here at the center, while some boys would go out to our, our, our secondary schools. We also have a strong sporting program. We have a member of staff who's, who's known as the house mother, and that person's responsibility is to look after the well-being of the boys, whether it's um, um, medical, hygienic, and, and, and so forth. So we, we have a, a wide variety of staff who caters to every need of the boys to ensure that when the boys leave here, they leave here as rehabilitated and well-rounded human beings. So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, we know that the Boys Training Center, there's a lot of misconception out there and a lot of persons don't really know what's really happening inside so at one time just speak to it and just dispel some of the misconceptions and let us dig deeper into um, these things that you know people say are happening at the center okay as you said yes um, I, I think a lot of people um, um, think make a perception of the boys training center out of a position of ignorance um, persons who visit the center regularly would know that these um, 
perceptions are not accurate of the center. Um, over the years, the boys' training center has um, been stigmatized. Um, some of it rightly so, but um, some of it probably unfairly. Um, the boys' training center, um, through the years, a number of boys have gone through the center. And the common thing is that um, the perception is that these boys are, 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 are little criminals and when they leave, they graduate onto the bodily correctional facility. But however, um, it's always the negative which gets highlighted. Um, there are a number of success stories coming out of the boys' training center. You will learn probably later on speaking to the welding instructor of boys who have come through boys' training center and have been able to, to open their own welding shops and start their own welding business. You would learn of boys who have left here and, and become um, custom officers, police officers, prison officers, boys who have left here and become ministers, you know, so um, that religious ministers, I mean. So there are a lot of success stories and there are a lot of hardworking persons at the center who, who aim to cater to the, 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 the well-rounded development of the boys here at the center. So these perceptions, I say, and I, I will always invite members of the public, if you, 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 you um, are concerned about the boys here at the center, you are welcome. You can call me. Um, I can give you my, my cell number. It's seven one eight eight zero zero nine. You can call. You can come in to see how best we can assist the boys here at the center. Because a lot of the boys, after they, after they leave or when they're about to leave, we have to seek employment for them, job placement, those that are no longer of, of, of school age. So we have to seek employment for them. So if persons out there um, are, are, are readily willing to employ some of our boys, then you can always come and, and, and assist us along the way. But um, generally, it is a very challenging environment that we work in at the Boys Training Center. And that is why we must have persons that are dedicated to the cause and, and, and the, the main priority must be the welfare of the boys. Um, another con um, 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 misconception, persons are saying that the boys at the center are being abused. Um, since I came in as manager in 2016, the statutory rules of the center gives the manager um, authority to practice co um, corporal punishment. And I have been here over this period and I've never once used that authority, even before it was um, um, stated by the Ministry of Education that corporal punishment will be abolished from schools. This is something that we totally do not practice here. And I will not um, um, accept that any staff member here at BTC um, will, will infringe or abuse the rights of a boy here at the center because these boys need love. Most of them come from an environment where they have been abused for the majority of their lives. And when they come to the center, we must pro provide them with that support and um, ensure that the environment is a safe one for them. I think in the conversation we had a little bit earlier, you mentioned that, you know, the center is not just about the boys being here, but the fact that the community needs to step in yes. to be able to support them because we hear a lot of stories that they're doing so well when they come and you talk about rehabilitation and the access to programs, whether it be educational and um, grammar based or whether it be technical. Um, just make an appeal to community members and to family members you know you you've seen it all in terms of people walking through the doors and sometimes i'm sure you have people who return to the center um so just speak to that aspect of it um in terms of the support that is needed for these boys okay um i, I will tell you that when a boy comes to the center our initial interaction with him and his support system probably his parents or family members we more than likely know if this boy will be a success after he leaves us. Because you can see throughout his stay at the center, um, someone is always checking up on him. Someone is always visiting him. They're always concerned about his well-being. Whereas we have some boys here who've been here for over a year and you hardly see anyone coming to visit them. It is a struggle for these boys after they, they leave here because they need that support. If they don't have that support, they will fall on the wayside. Um, the community, not just the, the immediate family, but the community as a whole need to be supportive of that boy. Because when he leaves, if, if the thing is that you know good, you came from boys training center, you're a little criminal, 
he will begin to believe what you what what you tell him so it is imperative because i have seen a number of boys that had so much potential leave boys training center and there is only so much we can do after they leave we the, the, the constant supervision we cannot we, because of our resources we cannot afford to continue that constant supervision these boys fall on the wayside and they we all know here at Boys Training Center would have had so much potential, so much talent. So it is, it is always disturbing, but it is most cases because of the size of our island and the resources that we have. When the boys leave us, they go back to the very same environment that sent them to us in the first place. So this is a challenge that we will continue to face until we have the resources to do otherwise. My final question for you, because, you know, um he was very adamant to say, it's not him alone, let's let everybody see all the people, the faces and, and, and the, the persons who, who run the Boys Training Center to just get a little bit more insight into the daily runnings. Um, earlier this year, you guys received support from the Prime Minister's um, Independence Ball yeah. um, fundraising um, activity. Um, let us know um, what you guys have planned for the funds. Okay. Um these funds came at a at, at a, a very um, good time for us. You know, with the onset of COVID and and, and the, the lack in, in um, of resources because of of the implications of COVID. Um, so these funds, we have decided that we will go on a beautification drive for the center. There's a number of areas that that needs to be uplifted um, because you you would understand that we have boys here that need to feel that they are in a homely environment. So we are going to, to do some beautification to the, the, the center itself. And some of that money, we are also going to use it to go towards um, our educational programming, agriculture, for example, where we have been making a lot of strides during the COVID period and up to now. So um, we have very good plans for this money. And, and these are some of the areas that will be used. Uh, Mr. Sonson, um, final thoughts and just let my viewers know mm -hmm. who we're going to meet um, as the show continues. Okay, as the show continues, you are going to meet some of our hard-working staff members. You are going to meet Ms. Jan McFarlane, who is one of our counselors on staff. You are going to meet Mr. Vincent Samuel, our auto mechanic and welding instructor. And you are also going to meet a gentleman by the name of Imran Edward, although he's not with us full time, but he's our current um, agriculture instructor and he has been doing a great job with our boys. So these are some of the persons that you are going to meet today. Thank you, Mr. Sonson, and thank you so much for your service. Wash your hands, wash them right. With soap and lots of water. Get between fingers, get under the nails, go above the wrists. Do this for no less than 15 seconds. Rinse properly. Dry with a clean towel. If there is no water, do the same washing motions with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer containing at least 70% alcohol. Wash your hands. Wash them right. This message brought to you courtesy the Bureau of Health Education of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Thank you so much, Mr. Sonson, for starting the feature on the center. Primarily, the Boys Training Center is engaged in the process of rehabilitative and reintegration of children between the ages of 10 and 18 years old who have been placed at the institution either in the category of children in conflict with the law or children in need of care and protection. Whilst at the institution, all children are exposed to a range of structured programs and activities that enhance their overall psychological development. Such programs which further their spiritual and character development are strategically geared towards helping them modify their behaviors while also furthering their academic and vocational growth. As such, children are guided to become productive and functional citizens who will return to their community and contribute to the development and security of the society. In this next segment, we meet the hardworking personnel at the center. The boys go through a daily program similar to school, seeing the counselor, classes, or engage in the welding and farming programs available. So let's meet the people behind the scenes. Jan McFarlane is the counselor at the Boys Training Center, and I'm going to have a quick interview with her, and she's going to let us know what it's like a normal day. What's a typical day here at the center as a counselor? Okay, good morning, and thank you. Um, I am one of the counselors, not the counselor at the Boys Training Centre. How many counselors? Um, we have now? three counselors, mm -hmm. um, a social worker, and a guidance counselor who um, does our aftercare program, which okay. is her main focus. Okay. Um, so, as a counselor at the Boys Training Centre, what 
we do is basically we manage the different cases. So every boy who comes to the center is assigned to one of the counselors at the center. Mm -hmm. And the, can the counselor takes over um, case management. And what that means is that we develop a holistic plan, which does not only entail psychological services, um, but educational services, building social skills, um, making linkages, collaborations, um, physical health, um, and all of that. So all of that would be part of the boys' treatment plan, which would be then implemented along with other team members at the center. So when the boys come into you, they're assigned to you, you basically get to know them and you develop a rehabilitative plan for them? That is correct. Okay. So when they come with us, we do receive some um, basic information from the organization, either it's probation or human services, um, through which they would have come to us. And from that, along with information from the boy himself, as well as family members, um, school administration if he was enrolled in the school, um, community members, our social worker would conduct a home visit to find out what the, the family situation is. And all of that information would be put into the treatment plan in the development of that plan for the boy. And then you just, you do that based on the time that you have and... Right, so for the duration of his stay with us, if he's with us for three months, six months, a year, that plan would continue until. Nice. What are some of the things that pop up, um, common issues that you get with the boys who enter the center? Common, I think, um, problems, whether it be in the household or personal issues. What are, on the top of your head, some of the things that are very common with the boys who come to the center? Okay, so I would say one of the most common is um, there's a lot of family dysfunction. So a lot of our boys come from vulnerable communities, um, marginalized families, and so that is, that is one of our biggest issues to contend with. Um, and a challenge with that is that because it's almost like we work with him in a vacuum at the Boys Training Center, it's difficult to make those linkages and those kind of interventions that you'd need within the family so that when he goes back, there's a better chance of success. So that is a big one for us. Um, a lot of them who come also, there is a lot of um, behavioral issues. Um, so in terms of substance use, um, gang initiation, um, anxiety, a lot of anger. And I, of course, I think a lot of the anger comes from the situations that they're coming from, right? At home. Yes, at home, in the community, even in the school, and um, not knowing how to deal with that. Um, a lot of them have poor social skills, um, poor conflict resolution skills. So those are some of the things that we work with them to develop. What is it that you'd like to tell the community or St. Lucia at large about the vulnerability of boys and the role we all play in upliftment and, you know, um, supporting them and being there for them? Because, you know, these days we don't see um, communities raising children like before, and as you mentioned, a lot of dysfunction. So what is it that would you, what would it like to see or say to St. Lucia on a whole, knowing everything that you know as a counselor here? Um, I think just from the boys' training center's perspective that um, in as much as we run an institution, we cannot do it alone. And we rely heavily on the family members playing their part, as well as um, wider civil society, um, the different uh, private sector organizations, um, the schools, right? Because a lot of them, the boys would come and they're already in school, they're enrolled. But once they become a ward of the boys training center, it's almost like the school, right? That you're a ward of the boys training center, but he was a student of your school before he came to the boys training center, right? And so you need to continue treating him as a student of the school and not a ward of the boys training center. Yeah. So I think so just that, discrimination. yes, just that basic understanding with everybody that yes, he's at the boys training center, but it is not for the boys training center alone to do. Yeah. All of us need to play our part and partner in order for us to see the success that we would want. Nice. And my final question for you is, um, you probably see a lot of sadness and a lot of heartache, you know, if the boys who come in on their stories. What would you say for you personally is um, the light at the end of the tunnel? What keeps you coming back to work every day? What is it that you look forward to being a counselor here? Well, my passion has always been to work with you. Um, and just the interactions with the boys and knowing that it can be better. And if all of us play our part, 
if we treat them just as, as a child, mm -hmm. as a child, as any ordinary child would want to be treated, right? That, that at the end of the day, we can see a difference. So just the boys motivate me and nothing else. Um, so no matter what mood I leave home, when I get here, it's about the work here, and that's that. Well, Ms. McFarland, thank you very much, and thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Right now, I have the agriculturist man right here first, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself. Uh, yeah, good okay. day, um, Mr. Edward from the Boys Training Center. I'm the acting agricultural instructor currently. I've been here for a period of eight months. What exactly is the role that you play here? What is it that you do? What is a daily run for you? So basically, um, what I do is I instruct the boys in the field of agriculture and also support the, the center's farm. All right. Um, out here, we have a wide range of agricultural activities that the boys are engaged in. And we're making a push towards trying to certify a few of them um, in the CVQ. All right. Um, we do crops, we do livestock, and we've also a slant into high-tech modern agriculture, for example, practices such as hydroponics, aquaponics, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so you said livestock. What livestock do you have? Okay, currently we have rabbits. We have a, ra a rabbit tree that we just initiated a few months back. Um, we also have a poultry pen, which we house layers. Currently, we don't have layers, but we house layers. And we sell eggs to the community, to members of the ministry, etc. Nice. And what crops do you have? I see, I guess this is an example of um, hydroponics. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So currently, in our hydroponic system, all right, this is a vertigrow hydroponic system. We grow crops vertically in it. We have a wide range of crops. We have lettuce, celery spring onions which is um, chives, we have Chinese cabbage and on the ground you'll see we also have pumpkin. All of that is being grown hydroponically. So let's talk about your experience with the boys. How is it? Do you have any issues teaching them, your engagement with them, what it's like? Okay, um, the boys they are teenagers. Um, of course they are from backgrounds where they may be troubled and so on. So they need encouragement. Um, we try to, as much as possible. It's not just academics but you also have to do a lot of life skill training on the job, mm -hmm. right? But um, so far, I can say my experience with them has been a good one. My final question for you is, um, how important um, is this agricultural program? And um, what benefit does it have um, for the world to go through it? Okay, the agricultural pro program is very important, especially now that we're going through a pandemic People are realizing more and more the importance of food and food security, okay? And of course, alternative em employment. Um, I would not say agriculture is alternative employment. I would say it is one of the basic things that the human being should be engaged in. So it's very important, especially to these boys, that they have a, a grounding in agriculture, a background in it, so that when they go out there, it can be one of the skills that can help them survive out there economically, all right? Yeah. yeah. Socially, Socially <laughs> etc. Yeah. And what's the name of the CVQ you mentioned? Um, well, it's um, CVQ in agriculture. Basically, it's um, Caribbean vocational qualifications. It's mm. re recognized throughout the Caribbean and the world. Okay. Well, Mr. Edward, thank you very much and thank you for your service. So we are now in the welding room at the Boys Training Center and I'm going to allow the instructor to introduce himself and let us know a little bit more about what he does on a daily basis. Okay, my name is Vincent Samuel mm -hmm. and I'm the welding and the fabrication um, instructor. Here basically we have two boys assigned to this workshop. They actually enroll in the program and we do basic fabrication. As you'd have noticed, if you look around, you see this basic welding and fabrication. You see iron, um, you see welding rods, and you see machines, power tools, as well as hand tools. And of course, some of the boys that are here with us, when they first came here, they didn't know anything about welding. They didn't know what's a chopping saw. They didn't know what's a welding rod. They didn't know what's a, an oxyacetylene plant. But ever since they came here, we have introduced this to them and we try to make it exciting. Now, we do face our own challenges with them as well, the numeracy and the literacy challenge. 
So you have to use what you call see better training, block training, as it relates to reaching them, to help them understand. If you look across to the board, we are dealing with a subject following health and safety in the work environment. And one of the ways you can help them understand that is by basically allowing them to demonstrate how they use the, the gadgets to protect themselves. You see them this morning welding, they have their masks on, they have their goggles, they have their overalls, they have the protective shoes, and so yes, the protection <laughs> shoes and so on. Okay, so what are some of the, um, I'm guessing you said that it's a CVQ program? Yes. A CVQ program. So you're hoping, what are some of the skills that they'll be able to transfer? Besides just welding, what mm. is it that you teach and instill in them? Well, I teach auto mechanics as well. Okay. Um, we've had three guys who left already. They only did three units in the level one auto mechanics program. We have limitations in terms of um, vehicles and engines. We have a few engines across there, but they are, um, I should say, antique, basically. We need more modernized engines to teach them. And because of this, we have been concentrating more on the welding. Now, to date, we have three boys that have done exceptionally well with the CVQ. It's a Caribbean Vocational Skills Qualification, mm -hmm. which is recognized all through the region mm -hmm. and St. Lucia as well. So we have three guys. One of them, he obtained the level one and the level two. He's now employed in a fabrication shop. And we have two others here who just completed level one, and now we're heading to level two. And I think the fact that they have gotten the certificate, it makes it exciting for them that, hey, I have achieved something, and no matter what the challenges are, we're going to go for it. So this gives me the drive and the motivation to move on with them. All right, and to help them acquire level two. Nice. And my final question for you is, um, I heard that you actually have a, a unique success story. Oh, yeah. A guy who came well, through, your, yes. through your hands and now employed fully as a welder. Yes. Actually, he was there. Was it the day before yesterday you were supposed to be here? Mm -hmm. He was there with his boss and his dad okay. in support. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it this morning. But I have, um, what I plan to do as I spoke to the manager, probably we could arrange some other time and you, myself, we could go up to his workplace and probably speak with him and mm. speak with his boss, and his boss could tell you how well he's doing. Because yeah. I think it would be nice to hear what he has to say mm. as he, he walks through the walls of BTC, and now he's out there exemplifying what he has learned here. Oh, but sure. thank you very much for the no interview, problem. and welcome. Keep, your, keep up your service. Oh, sure, certainly, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the opportunity to speak to one of the guys engaged in the welding class, and he's going to let us know what it's like. How has it been for you on a daily basis um, being a part of this welding class? Well, being a part of this welding class showed me different things. Different things meaning like patience, how to deal with different situations, not as you from BTC or wherever you may from, or even your background, um, people might describe your next way, but it's not so. Mm -hmm. BTC had showed me like a matter of school. I'd love, I'd like going to school. Mm -hmm. I'd come to BTC, I'd want to chat with my counselor, Mr. Sam and Mr. Son Son. Okay, what have you learned so far? Tell me something that you've done, completed in the welding class. The yeah. gate, uh -huh. the spiral step, the next step, and different other forms of burglar bars, the grill, as you can see. Okay, yeah. what, um, my last question for you, what do you enjoy about coming to welding? Well, to me, welding is everything for me now, because Mr. Sam always pull me on the side, tell me, Travis, what you're doing. I cannot be doing nothing. He'll tell me to do something, try something. Mm -hmm. um, Are you happy that you tried something? Yeah. What's this like, your teacher? What's your teacher like? Yeah, that's my teacher. You like him? Mm -hmm. He's yeah. a good teacher? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> to conclude our feature on the Boys Training Center for this week's installment of Stepping Up, we talked to the house mother and I'll allow her to introduce herself and just let us know a little bit more about what she does on a daily basis. Thank you. My name is Janice Eugene, house mother, acting. Um, basically, I am responsible for the overall welfare of the boys at the boys training center. So when a boy comes to the center or is um, <clears throat> sent into our care, after 
all the necessary assessments and protocols have the child the child has gone through all the necessary protocols as it relates to admission mm -hmm. this child is then referred to me and at that point I ensure that his human needs are cared for clothing shelter medical um, educational psychological um, all around I ensure that all his needs are cared for um, working together with the other so care and support staff at the BTC. I can imagine that you have a very close relationship with all the boys and you probably know that intimately and their stories. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I take a lot of time to get to know the boys and interact with them. Um, actually, I, I call them my boys because <laughs> they spend a lot of time with me. We speak. Um, normally, I'm here every other Saturday. And at that time, there are not many admin staff around and they profit that opportunity to come into my office and speak with me and we chat and we talk about little things that affect, affect them and bother them. And, you know, we reason as to the best ways, a better way of doing things. What's the highlight of coming to work every day? And you say that you've only been here for a year. What's the highlight? What is it that you enjoy doing the most as the house mother here? Well, I have always asked the Lord to place me in a position where I work with people and not machines <laughs> and um, for me I always look forward to coming to the boys because there's always something new um, my understanding of of them and what is expected um, gives me that additional motivation to come every day and to give my best um, I know, we know that they are trouble boys, but like I have always said, and I always say to them, they are not bad boys. They are normal boys like any boy. Unfortunately, circumstances or situations in life have brought them here with us. And what we focus on, and I focus on, and I try to instill in them, is that it's not lost. You are the bridge. We can cross it safely. Nice. Well, Miss, I was going to say, well, house mother, mother of the boys, one statement that you'd have to say to say, Lucia, because you know that the Boys Training Center has a lot of misconceptions and people say a lot of things about the center. So as house mother and mother of your boys, what is it that you want to tell them on behalf? Um, I think more than anyone else, I am better placed to tell anybody about, the, the B, about BTC, the Boys Training Center right now. Initially, um, prior to coming to the Boys Training Center, it actually took two years to get me here because I resisted. I worked at the transit home and my director then and the persons at the Ministry of Equity tried their best and I refused and it was because of the stigma associated with the Boys Training Center. But I must say, from day one I stepped my feet in, I realized it's not what people really say it is. It's just a perception. You have to be in it to understand it. We are not perfect. There are real challenges. But we know we are working towards making a difference. One of the biggest challenges for us is for us to understand that we are moving away from punitive to rehabilitative to developmental. And that is fundamental. That is a big challenge for us because of some of the behaviors that are displayed sometimes perhaps some of us are not well equipped and so do not understand where it's coming from and cannot associate and be able to place with it but i must say that my experience coming to the boys training center i would tell anybody is totally not what you hear out there well i definitely hear the passion seeping out through your <laughs> your response there everybody, it is definitely not what you hear out there yeah. change is a process it takes time mm -hmm. and certainly no boy walks through this door and leave here the same. same and that's the most important thing the most important thing well thank you very much for interviewing well um, being part of this interview thank, thank you for your service and thank you for your contribution you're most welcome <laughs> But it looks like we are at the end of the show for this week. 
Remember, we are always looking to feature people and organizations doing some amazing things. So feel free to shoot me an email at steppingup758 at gmail.com if you or you know someone who would like to be featured on the show. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Daniel Dubois. See you next time. Keep safe. And until then, don't forget to keep stepping up.